The following is a conversation with Jean Bruce Qua, aka JB. He's the co founder of Elev, a platform that facilitates students' uh, search for housing. Uh, Elev was started four years ago by a group of students who were trying to solve an issue that is a concern to almost all of us every year. Currently, it is functioning in uh, for students enrolled in University of Alberta, McEwen. Nate and any post-secondary institution located located in Edmonton. This team is amazing. Their product is simply one of the smoothest products I've ever interacted with, and I can't wait to see what they will bring next and what their next journey is. The audio quality of my microphone for this podcast for this podcast episode is not the best. I'm very sorry for that. I had a court issue that I um, realized after I had completed the recording. Uh, I did my best to mitigate the issue, yet it's it could have been much, much better. My apologies for that. Having that said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Zones That Podcast with Amirala Bigleri, and here is my conversation with JB. Hi, JB. Hey, Amir. <laughs> okay. Uh, for the last four years, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've been the chief operating uh, officer of Aleph, a platform that facilitates finding housing for students. Uh, what was the initial story behind it? So, Aleph, Aleph, Aleph started, um, well, it started like way before four years ago. It was actually like a like personal experience in that I went through uh, when I moved here um, for my studies at the U of A. I remember, I think, yeah, so I w- at first I wanted to live on campus, okay, but then I somehow managed to miss the uh, the, the deadline to apply for, to live on residence, and so I was like, oh, snap, I have to leave, I have to find another place, like, to stay that's, that's like, within the the, the, the the vicinities of campus, Um, but the good thing that also happened, it was, like, it was like most like a blessing in disguise, because although I missed the deadline to apply for residence, I didn't realize how expensive living on campus actually was until like later on but essentially when that happened i remember like from, i think it was like from like february or march when i got accepted until august 22nd every day i woke up and i was on all the different platforms so kgg Facebook marketplace press faster you name them i was just there looking for a place to stay off campus and it was like super challenging you know and pretty stressful as well because like i have to go also i also had to apply for the visa right to find so to, to essentially like um like when the visa they asked you for like a place a residence all that stuff uh thank god for um, um, um the university like i was able to like use the university as an as, as a place to stay but had i had they not been there like i had to like essentially like go through the whole process of looking for a place to stay um talking to like landlords from overseas it's like imagine like as a landlord you, you're chilling here in edmonton and you have an international student that's somewhere in tanzania reaching out to you and be like oh by the way i like a place i want to live there nine out of ten people said no because <laughs> because they were like you're not here you need to come and check out the place and two and two it's like well what guarantees us that like you're actually gonna move here and actually stay in this place like i can't hold the place for you until you come here <clears throat> so i went through that and then even when I came here, um, um, like I had to like even like look for a place. Like I stayed at a hotel for a couple of days while I was looking for a place to stay um, uh, on cam- off campus. And like even then, it was a little bit challenging as well to find a place. And even when I found a place, everything around it was also like pretty challenging in the sense of, like it was like a new culture, new place. I'm a first move from my family, and so like everything was just brand new. And I was like what seventeen, and so like. I, and I was sort of like expected to like know everything and know my way around everything, which wasn't obvious. Uh, and like that personal challenge that I went through, that personal struggle that I went through, um, sort of like fueled my motivation to sort of like find a better way, f- f- find a new solution, you know, like like there had to be a better way of doing things. And so like me and my other co-founders sort of like came together and they figured, you know what, there is a problem. We could potentially find a solution. So let's work together to, to, to build a lab. And and how old were you at that time? Um, at that time I was, I would say like nineteen going twenty. Whoa, that's wild. Yeah, nineteen going twenty. That's how I was at the time. Yeah. So you were in your second year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I was my second year. I think my second year going to my third, and 
at that moment i was also looking for like a co-op so it was when i was like looking for like an internship and i was also working part-time and i had school and um i remember when i because like that's when um, um kevin actually uh approached me um and how, how how it happened was that like i had a mutual friend that was actually working on this project as well and um he said he was showing me like the numbers like oh yeah by the way me and this guy was sort of like working on this project together you know like doing this thing and all that stuff and I was like, oh that's pretty cool but can i see the numbers so like he showed me like a spreadsheet you know that, 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 that shows someone so i was like oh that looks pretty cool you know what if you tried this and you did that oh what about this regression what about that so i was asking a lot of questions on the numbers because i was pretty interested and so um like he was like oh you know what you should talk to my friend and that friend was kevin and kevin is the other sorry co-founder uh yeah, Kevin is the, hey, Kevin's the other co-founder. Uh, met with him. We talked about it. We talked, discussed, and then from there, I sort of like joined the project, and I was just looking at the numbers, and then from there, it just the rest was just history. Okay, what 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 were the numbers? What were you looking at? Um, so the numbers that we're looking at is like essentially, essentially like, like like the potential of the idea, you know, like projections and sort of like some initial research that were done, but like. You well from, from from my perspective because I'm a numbers person. It's like I was like, oh, this looks good, but there's some things that I'm missing. And like, if you made a few made, made like a few tweaks here, essentially like, okay, what if instead of just focusing on Edmonton, right? What if we just expanded across Alberta and across Canada, and we looked at, okay, what about the, what what about the situation for people coming from overseas? Because like, I came from overseas and I have like this background from overseas. Like, okay, what if we like build something that that like that like that would also help them. What would those numbers look like? And so those are the things that are the questions that I'm asking. Even like assumptions behind the numbers as well. And then from there, like sort of like led into some conversations that led into me joining. And then now I'm sort of like the COO now. Okay, let's turn to the business side of things. I mean, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, could you please explain the business model behind your life? Uh, what's the plan to generate revenue for the short term? And what's also the plan to keep it sustainable for the long term? yeah no that's a very good question so business model the way it works is we charge a percentage of the rent per per month and so with alev we essentially took a holistic approach with being on the platform and making sure that it doesn't just touch on like housing but like everything around housing and everything around living off campus as a student and so what i mean by that is that we know that when it comes to looking for a place because we went through it there's like the whole process of like okay you go on the platform and you look for the property and then you get in touch with the landlord so you could either book a viewing or you can book an application and then after that you could essentially if you like it the next step is to sign a lease and then to pay the rent now we stream the whole process onto the platform so that like as a student it's pretty much like a one-stop shop so you find a place you book the viewing it's an application sign the lease pay the rent and then everything that comes after that and so essentially what, what, what we're doing is so that, 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 that the price that we charge is essentially um, 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 like incorporates all the different aspects. And same thing as well for the landlord, right? Because as a landlord, like there are many things that go into the picture, right? Like listing your property, making sure the property is well kept, making sure that you find the right tenant, making sure that the rent is paid. Like that's very important. Making sure that like rent is paid is super important. And so being able to like manage all of this into one app as well for students is definitely something that's super, super important. And so in terms of like business plan, Charge a percentage of the fee per 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 per, per, per month. Essentially, whenever the student, whenever the, the landlord play, lists the property, whatever the student sees is whatever is what they pay. And same thing as well for the landlord. Whatever they post, um, whenever they list the fee that they see is what they pay, and the amount that they see is what they receive. So like everything is super transparent from the get go. Um, now in terms of the short term, um, right now our strategy has been because we because this is sort of like a marketplace and it requires volume to take off. Um, right now, we're sort of like funding it from pitch competitions, grants, um, uh, and like, of course, sweat equity. So like our own our own little monies that we have that can put together to keep the business running. But in terms of long term, long term um, um, business plan, there are many. The, the, the great thing about this platform is that because it's a marketplace, um, once you get that volume, that essentially like that, 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 that magic number that allows you to break even, any number that goes over it is essentially profit, right? So then that's actually where we are sort of like trying to go. Now, the next thing is there are many verticals that we can explore, right? So like, for example, um, once you move into a place, right? The next thing that you need to do is get a phone, 
okay what if you work with a essentially like a phone like a like a like a internet provider or like a telus or whatever and essentially like for every student that comes through that, that, that we get you through a lev there is a fee that comes into it same thing as well with the credit card you know because you need to like get a like a debit or a credit card or whatever and then like essentially like having all those different pieces into in, in, incorporate into the platform to make it easier for students and of course have like another way to generate revenue and another thing that we're also working on is essentially the, the the whole aspect of helping the student build a credit score as well through the rent payments now one thing that we know is that here in canada uh, I guess even in North America, like credit is something that's super important. Like where I'm from, we don't do credit. <laughs> like that's something that when I came in it was something pretty new to me as well. Like we don't really do credit. But it's something really important and like it allows you to tap into different um opportunities. So like for example, like a mortgage or like a car loan or like even a loan in general. And like, having a good credit is super important. And so what if you could bank on your ability to, on, on your on your rent payments to sort of like help you build that credit score. And as a student, if you're living off campus, that's at least two years. Right, of you building your credit score just just by paying your rent on time, and so sort of like exploring that 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 the avenue and seeing how we can sort of like use that as a way to like support students, and of course you know make some money along the way, but most importantly like help students uh, make sure that they get the most out of the experience living off campus. Just make sure I understood correctly. Yeah, the the, the what's it called? The grand goal is to create a platform that allows you to just with one click be able to find your residence with the internet utilities mm -hmm. rent etc yeah. with some perks such as like building your credit score and whatnot is that right yeah that's correct yeah okay so if i'm understanding correctly then you're doing a service to both landlord and the students, students. as a result uh, the the revenue should be taken from both landlord and the students. Yeah. If I understand correctly. Yeah. So, what's what's the pricing strategy? Like, what's the split? Is it like more landlord, more students? Mm -hmm. How, how does that work? Yeah, so that's a good question. Sorry, sorry, you, you don't. Yeah, no, 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 that's that's a good question. Um, and that's something that we're sort of like testing right now. Um, in terms of pricing strategies, because one it varies, of course, like th the season also varies in the sense that like, we've seen that over the summer is when most students are looking for a place to stay, right? Because many students, the way the the, the way this, the 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 cycle works is students look for a place to stay, um. To, so, so, so something that, that that matches their semesters so like either from like september to december or december to april or september to april or september to august right so like essentially matches how long they have with school and so <clears throat> Making sure that like the seasonality is also taken care in, taken in consideration into the pricing. Another thing that we also look at is essentially um sort of sort, sort of like the demand in general, right? Because if you have a higher demand, um and with a higher demand and which something that's pre um 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 something that's very uh, known today is like the whole housing supply or uh, housing shortage right so then if there's a higher demand that pushes the price of the of the property and so we're trying to find a way to like essentially accommodate for that for students to make it cheaper for them to find a place to stay off campus um but essentially when it comes to like, the pricing itself it's sort of like it's balanced between the landlord and the students and so right now we're sort of like testing to see what's the actual accurate price that we should charge um and so to give like an actual answer like when i split equally like split between the landlord and the students now there have been instances whereby like it's more on the students than on the landlord and more on the landlord than more than the students to make sure that like it balances out but <clears throat> when it comes to the price itself the 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 reason behind it is that um both both um benefits from the service that we provide and uh making sure that both are charged in in in, in a uh, fair manner is what's really important for us um um, now, like I said earlier, we're still testing the price to see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And there are many services that we're offering right now um, that are also like sort of like match the price that we are charging. Okay, you said you're, you're a numbers guy. Yeah. Uh, that helped me out in here. Uh -huh. So uh, having the uh, cap on the number of international students that are coming, that definitely affects your target audience. Mm -hmm. um, Moreover, there's also a housing crisis, so mm -hmm. you have a very specific number of landers that are able to, you know, give support. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Support the program. So, how does the? And you're saying that you're trying to test whether different strategies work. How does the 
pricing strategies, how does different, how do they project? So what, what's all this in your head? Like, how is it going in your head? Now? How do you sleep at night? <laughs> okay. Tonight, maybe my push is going okay, but tomorrow I have to start from scratch and just run the numbers again and say, oh, the strategy. Yeah, no, the how do I sleep at night? I don't, I don't sleep at night. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> because it's like you put out one fire and another one comes up and another one comes up and like it's like oh man so you know you don't sleep <laughs> you just hope for the best but to be honest um the way we see things is with challenges come opportunities right um one thing that we're seeing a lot is that there is a huge like for, of course the international student cap that's been put on right now um one is very unfortunate for international students because there, there, there are many opportunities here in canada that many international students can benefit from and it's unfortunate to see that like there's like a cap but the reasoning also behind the cap also makes sense in the sense that like with high high it's not just like it's not that it's because of international students but just like population in general like higher population put pressure on the housing market and so with of course like right now the the, the, the amount of housing even available and the rate at which the pace at which houses are being built is pretty low and so simple economics high demand low supply pushes the price of rent and then becomes more expensive for students and also with for, for the general population in, in, in general. So it makes it a bit more challenging for for um, students to find a place that's affordable for them. And so having that cap sort of like prevents them from finding themselves in a situation whereby if you come in and you come in with expectations like, oh yeah, I'm going to live in Canada, it's going to be cheap. And then you come, the surprise, surprise. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Rent is on the rise. Groceries on the rise. Um, like, Everything, everything is pretty much on the right. And inflation is also on the right. I mean, like, we saw that, like, it recently cooled down to 2.9%. But, like, we had, like, the 4 and 5% for the past couple of months. So, like, pretty much everything is getting more expensive. And so the reality of things is, like, like of course, life in Canada is great. But, man, it's getting expensive. And so, like, something to keep in mind when it comes to, like, that cap. Now, when it comes to sort of, like, finding that middle ground, you know, to, like, support the students um, and the, to support the students finding affordable housing and the landlord finding, um, like, essentially having enough landlords to support those students, that's still a work in progress, you know. Um, we're trying different strategies to sort of, like, a, 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 to acquire those landlords that are, that have even, like, like, an extra bedroom or an extra, like, an apartment or even an entire house to rent out to students. Um, and one thing that we're sort of uh, um, I'm looking into is essentially looking at it as a way, it's not looking at it as a way that you're not necessarily supporting just, just another tenant or just another, um, like, an, just another number, but you're also, like, making it like a, like a, like a social impact investment because students contribute, I think the, the, the number, correct me if I'm wrong, but the number was that, like, international students can contribute up to, like, $22 billion a year to the economy, which is huge, right? Like, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, like, it's, it's understated, you know? And so, like, being able to, like, support that segment of tenants, you know, like, helping the students um, find a place to stay and helping them in the academy, it's, like, it's not, you like you know, like, like I said, you're not just helping, like, another number. You're helping someone that's going to contribute to the economy. And so, you, on like, as a landlord, you're not just, like, helping a tenant, like, you're helping the economy. And so, it makes sense for you to host a student. And, Second thing is like students statistically are one of the most reliable tenants to have because one, once they stay, once they find a place to stay and they're with you, they're more likely to stay with you until the end, many stay until the end of their of the tenancy, of their sorry, of the school, but they also stay until like after they graduate because they're like, oh yeah, I found this place I'm comfortable here. Why leave? And secondly, um, they are able to sort of like not necessarily afford the rent, but they can cover the rent in the sense that they either have like a student loan because as a student, if you start to go to school, you need to make sure that you have everything else covered, right? Like you don't want to find yourself struggling to like afford rent or all the other stuff. And so like you having like a student loan or the scholarship or the grant, and even like the guarantor helps you cover that rent. And so essentially like bringing those different um, aspects. Oh, sorry. And the third, the third thing I want to touch on is the fact that Many students like you and I, right? Like we are very serious about our studies. And so there's, there's this whole stigma of students being like partying or like being, uh, not, like keeping keep the place in, in a mess and all that stuff. And you'll be surprised, like the, many students, I'm pretty sure the ones that are looking at this podcast, watching this podcast right now, or listening to the podcast right now, are the serious ones. And they just want to find a place to come and scratch, sleep, go back to school after classes, go to the library, study, <laughs> come back home. 
<laughs> and crash again. <laughs> and so you want to keep, you, they keep the place clean. And so being able to like showcase and portray your students to the landlords that have this, that extra units available is a win and a benefit for them, but also a benefit for the economy in general. And so essentially using those different like strategies to acquire those landlords and also support your students in, pro in the process. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, you're a student of the School of Business at U of A? Well, actually, I I was I didn't go to school of business. I was in the faculty of arts, and oh, I did I did I, I did. No, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Like everyone, everyone does I did business, but I actually did economics. So okay. <laughs> that's why I love numbers. You're still a, a student of economics. Well, uh, I, I was still of economics. I think for, I was here for, for life, for life in general, because I actually graduated last summer. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> You're making this really hard for you. <laughs> it's not good, man. It's not good, man. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay. We're mixing. It's okay. As, as the CEO of Alev, yeah. let's say the world is an ideal situation. There is no cap yeah. on yeah. the number of landlords nor the number of um, tenants. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find the balance between affordability and profitability, uh, profitability in, in any market? Well... That's a good question. The balance between profitability and affordability. I think that's a good question. I think in any market, now I'm about to uh, I'm about to uh, piss some people off, <laughs> but in any market, <laughs> you need profits. <laughs> like profit is a motivation for many to get into business. I mean, many people like, of course, many people say that yeah, I'm going into business for like a good cause, like want to help people. That's great, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you need to pay the bills, and you need to make ends meet, and you have all those different like like in the, in in the, in this real world, like you need to have all those things covered for, and profit plays a big role in that. Now, of course, you don't want to get greedy to the point where like there's so much profit that it's not good for society. But essentially, having enough profit to enjoy, like essentially, no, to, to essentially support the business, but also like support yourself and like whatever necessity that that need to be covered. Now. <clears throat> In an ideal world, between this is find the balance between affordability and profitability. I think there are many things that come in play, right? Like for example, being able to um, ensure that, like, I think the, the the word is the the word here is propensity to consume. But essentially, by charging a rent, like, but essentially charging a a, 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 a rent price that doesn't negatively impact the person paying that rent and not charging not um charging too low of uh rent to prevent the landlord to afford the other bills so essentially find that balance to essentially ensure that you're benefiting both the landlord and the students while also you know making some profit along the way is is is, is definitely something to keep in mind as you go about that balance and so to answer your question i think not wanting to be not being greedy in the process and also making sure that everyone involved at least gains to gain gains to the maximum to, to the maximum that's sure, okay okay you mentioned uh how kevin and you got technically connected through a, through a mutual friend um yeah. building a team building a successful <laughs> startup technically mm -hmm. often hinges on having a good team yeah uh, what were the initial strategies for assembling the team? Uh, what were the thoughts on overall how many people you guys are going to need? Yeah. Considering that you had to build an application technically. Yeah. And how have those strategies evolved over time? Yeah, that is a very good question. And that was, that, that's, 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 that's actually an expensive question. Because I remember when we were building the team, oh man. Now, I'm not trying to throw shades at anybody here. You know, like the team were awesome. People that were on the team were awesome. The issue was in the beginning, there's a lot of figuring out. Like, and as a founder, your way of thinking is different than a person that you're adding on to sort of like take over a role, if that makes sense. So as a founder, you are a different role. You, you wear many hats. You know, one day, one day I'm in charge of operations, another I'm in finance, another way, another day I'm on the ground talking to a landlord or talking to a student 
or pitching. You know, like I'm wearing different hats. Same thing for Kevin. Same thing for Quasi, who's on CTO as well. Um, but your way of thinking is different to someone essentially coming in to fill in a role. In the sense that someone that's filling in a role, and there's nothing wrong with that. But essentially, someone that's filling in a role is essentially there to fill that role, and that's it. In the sense that, if for example your your job is to make is to um, let me take a random. Let's for example your your job is to do social media, okay. As a as 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 a founder, I have different expectations than you would as someone that's interested in social media. So social media, some people just come and be like, okay, I should be on social media. I'll be posting maybe one or two posts a day or one or two posts a week, and then I will engage with two, with, with maybe three or four pages. Uh, a, a, a week and then that's it you know but you as a founder you're like okay that post that we're posting today how is that gonna let lead how is that gonna lead us to two or three more followers was that gonna lead us to one more um sign up on the app and how is this engagement going to lead me to more essentially like essentially like um, um, attract essentially give me more um, um visibility and attract more people to my platform you know like you know like, like, like you think differently and so the reason why i say that is because when we're starting Okay. One, um, I think it was about maybe like that first year, and that's you know that's when I knew that I wanted to like double down on, on the level. That first year, um, we didn't have like there was no product, no nothing. It was just an idea that we had in mind, and we went through this one accelerator. Um, it was called it was called like the accelerator. It was out of Calgary. Uh, I think we, ha- we actually had to pay to get in, which is crazy. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, uh, we, <laughs> we went through an accelerator out of Calgary. And um, I remember, I think it was like the last, like the, at the end, they have, um, I think it's called like the startup showcase, but like essentially each each platform that each idea that went through the, 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 the program, at the end, they come in and they pitch uh, the business and all that stuff in front of like a, an audience. So like some, some are investors, some are grants, all, all that stuff, right? And so Kevin actually wasn't one that went. Kevin and Quasi went. I, I didn't go. Kevin and Quasi went. Kevin actually went there and he pitched to this one um, angel investor. Uh, and take it, like I said, there was no product. Like there was no product. It was just an idea. Kevin went. And he met an investor and he managed to sell the idea to the investor to the point where the investor took out his wallet and actually signed a check to a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds that had just an idea which to me was crazy no right it was crazy <laughs> and i remember kevin sent us that picture on the group he's like yep this one is in the back i got it i was like you got it became he's like yep coming in the mail make sure you check the bank because it's coming in I was like, bro. And I remember, I think maybe like two, three weeks later, the check actually cleared and it came in. I was like, oh my was goodness. Legit. It was legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it went from like just an idea to like, oh snap, this is real now. Like, this is actually real. Like, now we actually have to execute on this, you know? And when we got this grant, um, the cool thing about, sorry, when we got the check, the cool thing about this is about, 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 about grants here in Canada is that, like, there's like a lot of like grants and wage subsidies that, if you have one thousand dollars, example, if you, let's example you have ten dollars, ten dollars, you can turn that into thirty or forty dollars, because like the waste subsidy, for example, they can cover. Let's say for example, you have a waste subsidy that can cover up to like um seventy uh, percent of a wage or somebody's wage. So if you put ten thousand, if you put like uh ten thousand dollars. Uh, they will cover the remaining seven thousand dollars. So then you keep you. So then you you. So then you keep set. So 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 if you, if you have ten thousand dollars, if the contract costs ten thousand dollars, okay, you put three k. They put the other seven k. Now of course you have to pay the ten k, but then they'll pay you back the seven k. So then you keep the seven k and then you spend only three k instead of ten k. And so that's actually how we're able to like stretch the dollars. And the reason why I say that is because because we knew we could do that. We're like, oh well, if we want to grow fast. We need to hire more. And so at one point, the team was about 17 people. Yeah. Yep. 17 people. 17 talented people. Now the challenge, like I said at the beginning, we were still figuring out. And because all of us were figuring out, the people that we hired, sort of like, the people that we hired, like they were not, they were not like figuring out like we were figuring out. They're figuring out in the sense of like, okay, What's my duties? Like, what, what am I supposed to do? 
But us, we're also figuring out, okay, like, okay, now we've reached this point. What are each of these people supposed to do? And what are we even ourselves supposed to do? Which we hadn't figured that out yet. So we just hired, but then it was like, every day we're just figuring out. And it was like, no clear metric. And there was no, and so we're self like, of course we're growing, but we're burning more money than actually like getting a return of, on, on our investment. And so at some point we had to make the honest decision to be like, you know what? You are a great, super talented person, but we have to let you go. And have to let people go one by one by one. Super. Like, they don't tell you this when you're running a business, but letting people go, man, it's one of the most heart-wrenching thing to do, man. I'm telling you, like, because I had to do it, you know, and it's super challenging, you know, like, because like, you get close to those people, right? But over time, it's stuff like realize, like, okay, we don't need to have, like, a big team. Like, let's cut down into maybe, like, because I, I, I want people to cut down to, like three people, like three people were just me, Kevin, and Quasi. And we're like, okay, the three of us have to figure out what the hell is going on. And then from there, we're self like, put out a game plan and so going from three. And then, like, literally, the strategy for us to add another person to the team was unless me or me, Kevin, and Quasi are absolutely stretched, like, as thin as possible, then we can add someone else to the team. Otherwise, we have to stay and we have to move as a unit of three people and then that's how we went yeah but but still setting up the intensity for the fourth person who comes in yeah is very challenging especially when you are saying okay i'm gonna put my hundred percent yeah and if i really can catch up yeah then i'm gonna ask someone to put their 20 percent, 30 percent and that's still I don't know, there is something specific of setting up the culture mm. um, to, to, although, I don't know, for example, to although let people know that, okay, like you don't have, you're not going to have the same shared or, or technically um, objective as I'm going to have, mm. uh, nor the reward. Mm. At the same time, we are moving somewhere, mm. and that's a common goal. Mm. So we got to put Technically, the same amount of energy. Yeah. To some proportions, of course, but yeah. setting up the intensity is very hard, as you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. You you have the uh, what's it called the the results in your mind, mm. and the, the employee is gonna have the um, okay. I'm gonna have this routine. I'm mm. gonna set up an object, objective for what I do. Mm. Uh, mm. No emphasis on the results. So mm. that's still that's still a tr tricky part, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that. I think the 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 the, the, the thing to I me mean, I guess one, one thing that we learned through the experience is that we're able to like sort of understand that if we want to add someone like on a full time basis, you know, like that's gonna come and like stay with us like permanent, quote unquote, um, they will need to operate like a like like, like a founder. I need to think like a founder. And they need to move like a founder and need to like execute like a founder. What I mean by that is that you don't, you don't, you're not satisfied with status quo. Like regular, like the number, the regular standard stuff, like that's not something that we're satisfied with. Like you have to like think two, three, four, even 10 steps ahead. You know that, like, how is that one action that you're doing today relates to the vision that we have for tomorrow? And so, what I mean by that is that from that experience, we're able to, 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 to define. One, what's the quote unquote culture that we want? You know, what's the intensity that we're looking for? What's the mindset that we're looking for? But also be able to divide between someone that's going to come in permanent, like full time, and someone that's going to be contracted out. Right? And so for the contract part, contracting out part, it's been pretty like easy to figure out in the sense that, okay, let's say, for example, we're working on this one feature and our hands are, our hands are, our hands are, are, are tied. Let's put together like a plan that somebody's gonna follow to the T. Like literally, here is the plan. All you have to do is execute. The reason why I can't execute today is because I don't have time. If I had 25 hours or 28 hours in a day, for sure I can do it, but I can't. So you're gonna do it, you're gonna go and you're just gonna do it. And I'll play more of like a supervisor role, you know, like oversee the the, 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 the the project. So that's essentially like the contracting our part. Now the other part, which is like adding someone on the team, honestly. Um, we have actually hired, we have actually added someone on the team recently. She's our, um, not, not recently, like she's been with us for like, maybe like two years now, two, three years now. And man, like she's been like, 
amazing, like the perfect addition to the team. Now, again, I am not throwing shade at anybody else. Everyone that joined the team was a perfect addition to the team at the time that they joined us. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to just make it sure. Now, going back to <laughs> we recently we hired on the team. She actually, like, you know, some people, like, they, they show the traits before they even join the team. You know, like when he started, it was like she was like when, because she she just she joined the marketing team. So like she's the one every, everything that, that, that all the marketing that you see on Alev on our Instagram, TikTok, social media, everything. She's pretty much like the mastermind behind it because like when she joined, when she first joined, it pretty much started us started about her asking questions. Like she was just asking a lot of questions. It's like why did you post this? What are you hoping to get out of this? Who's your audience? Now all these questions are like. Back then, I, me, I was just posting to post. Like, we were just posting to post because we need to be active, you know? Like, if you're not active, you're not relevant. If you're not relevant, people are not going to pay attention to you. If you don't, you don't pay attention to you, you lose clients. So, I mean, I was like, you know what? Let's at least in one way or another stay relevant. But then she just asked questions. What about this? What about that? What about this? But I was like, okay, this is a pretty insightful question that you're asking. Come and let's have a chat. So then she talked to all three of us and they were like, you know what? Let's just try it out. Let's just contract you out and then see how it goes. And then from the contract, we're like, yep. As soon as she did a contract for like a few months, we're like, yep, you are staying on the team. For as long as we can afford you, you're going to be on this team and you're going to work with us. And since then, it's been a blessing in disguise. But the reason why I say that is because like her mindset was like similar to one of a founder. You know, like, of course, we have to train her and like show her like how we operate, how we like the vision that we have. But then like she had like she had like the, the, the energy, the intensity, and she was willing to put in the work and, you know, like go through the ups and downs with us. And so we're like, you know what? Yeah, no, whatever we can do to keep you on the team, we will do it. And uh, so, I don't know. I know I went on many tangents here, but I hope that answered your question. No, it does. It, it does. Don't worry. Um, yeah, okay. Now, uh, on the multiple tangents that you went on, <laughs> yeah, a little bit different one of them. Um, I'm assuming that, the, that all of your team are students. Technically, used to be students, yeah. and some of them are still students. Yeah. Um, how would you maintain the team's morale? when it's you know december mm -hmm. uh you've, you've got a bunch of paperwork to do before the new year's yeah you've got also exams and yeah. a lot of other things so yeah. it's it's a hell yeah so how do you keep up with how do you prioritize first of all and yeah. how do you keep the team's morale up? yeah very good question that's a very good question um i have a question do you watch the office yes you have the office okay so i've watched the office maybe like eight or nine times like i just be watching it because it's just too funny um there is this one episode where michael and jim they were co-managers and at some point it was announced that like some of the news that dunder mifflin was about to be like sold and going bankrupt yeah. and all that stuff yeah. and uh i don't know if you remember like jim was like very serious like man this is for me but you know what it's not over let's keep working and all that stuff and then michael was like oh let's play the game <laughs> <laughs> you remember so good come back <laughs> exactly <laughs> he said let's play the game who i think was like there's a murder in town something like that i forgot what it was oh oh i forgot the name of the, of the game but then she was like a murder thing that, 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 that like it was like yeah let's play the game and then Jim was like, why are we doing like, like Michael, we should be playing, we should be like focusing on work, getting work done, you know, even though they see the news might get bunker. Michael was like, nope, let's play a game. And then he snapped. And he said something that was like really, really interesting. He said, these people need this right now. You know, like, you know, like, you know how when you're on a boat and the boat is sinking and like one person trying to like make sure the boat doesn't sink on itself and you have kids with you and you want to make sure that like, you know what, even though the boat is quote unquote sinking, you want to keep them like keep the moral up you want to keep them up keep them happy make sure that like they don't focus on the bad thing that's happening that's essentially how we go about stuff like keeping the morale up because one thing that we know is that like the inevitable is going to happen if one day god forbid a love doesn't work out or one day you have to close shop or whatever if it's going to happen it's going to happen you know but during those during the, the, the those days when it's down and you know just like many things on the go and you have like you know deadlines coming up and like um like a like a customer that's cursing you out telling you that your app is trash or you have like the, the essentially the world seems to be going to to to, to shit part of my part of my language okay um 
you need to remember that as long as you're standing with your ten toes, your ten feet are here, your hands are here, okay, have a roof on your head, there's food on the table, you'll be fine. You know? And being able to understand that there are gonna be those days when it's gonna get challenging, you know, but like it's your job as a leader to make sure that your team is essentially positive. You know, like they essentially keep moving throughout the the, 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 the the difficult times, you know, and understanding that like sometimes even if, if 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 this one person has too much on the go to be like, you know what, hey, you have too much on the go, let me help you out. You have too much on the go, take a break. Or you have too much to do, relax. You know? That's what we're here for. And be like be, be able to like bat, like essentially like lean on each other to sort of like support support each other. And so essentially to, to answer your question, you know, I know I go on many tangents to answer tell you this story. But essentially it's, it's about being able to understand that sometimes it's okay to like step back. You know, you don't have to be there. Like, of course you want to be there 24-7. You know, you want to be working 24-7. But sometimes it's okay to understand that we're human, life happens, and if it's too much, take a step back. If you can do it today, fine. Come back tomorrow. Just make sure that like tomorrow you come in, you come in with like and give it two hundred percent. You know, give me hundred percent. Give me the best that you can. If today you can't do it, that's fine. We can always do it tomorrow, and then go from there. So, what's the, what was the process of doing the market analysis that um, made you guys confident that okay, this is the right time, uh, we should go for it, and. That's number one. But that's question number one. And question number two is how are you planning to expand into new markets? You know, changing the audience. I, I know the primary audience is still students, mm -hmm. and um, but how are you trying to expand that? Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. Good question. When it comes to market trend, um, for us, it started when. Like, I mean, sorry from, from our own personal experience, you know, to sort of like go through it and see that there's actually nothing out there for students in particular. Now, there are like listing depositories. So like, for example, like, um, like the platform, there was some, 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 some platform that work with universities to essentially help their students find listings. So like, I think this is place called, I think it's called for rent, no rent. Rent, I forgot what it is, but it's like, it's like it's like a platform that just helps. Essentially, like it's work with the university to just help the student find housing off campus. But once you find the place, you're on your own, right? And we went through it in the sense that like there's more than just finding a place. There's also like the living portion of it, you know. And so when we did the research, we realized that many of the many of the platforms that were out there were either one not catered to students in particular. They would be catered to like the general population, and then as a student, you have to compete against like professionals or like people that have a full-time job that have a credit score and all that stuff so like you're, you're essentially fighting a losing battle and the second thing is many of these listings will help students only until they find a place now once you find the place it's just you have to figure out everything by yourself now you're already figuring out life you're also figuring out school now you have to figure out how to live <laughs> of campus <laughs> like, how's that fair <laughs> you know and so we figured like okay there is an opportunity here that's like there is something that, 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 there's something that hasn't been done like that for students before. Now the second thing is everything that we're seeing today. Like this, these are trends that we've been seeing when we started. Like there is a rise in students that are moving over, like international students coming to attend uh, a, a school here in Canada. There's a rise in students getting education, um, uh, like post post secondary education. And like when you look at graduating students from like high school. Um, going to like post secondary institutions, like that, that number is rising over time. And so we figured, like, okay, these numbers are rising, and you will reach a point where there is more students than houses available. And so we figured that, like, that was like sort of like the, the some of the different um, key factors that give us that green light to be like, okay, let's start now and let's, let's start pushing for this platform that we're building, like, right now, like ASAP, because 
the people are coming and they will need that that, that, that product you know and essentially that's how it went we went to sort of like figure out that the time was now for us to go out uh, about it and even like right now you even see it right now like in cities like in, in cities like toronto or vancouver well it's insane i don't know if you saw that um kid that the, 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 the student that travels from Calgary yeah. that's insane and he saves money that's <laughs> wild <laughs> that's wild <laughs> And he saves money. <laughs> like he makes like he sells like six hundred dollars a month, but just by traveling every week, which is insane. And it shouldn't be though. Like it shouldn't be the case. And like you have many students that are in that situation, or like students that like I think in, in like in Ontario, some students share like a like like a living room. Like they share like a space in the living room, which is crazy. Like imagine coming from overseas, your parents your parents spending the life savings because in many for many students, the parents invest in you. They could have bought a house. Like with me, my parents could have bought a house, but they put the money in me, and now I have to come and live in a living room on a mattress. That's insane, right? <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> and so that's, 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 these are some these are some of the things that we're trying to combat through eleven, being like, oh hey, look, you as a student can find a place that's affordable that will give you that peace of mind that you deserve in order for you to achieve the academy success that, that, that academy success that you came to look here. In, in in canada look for it here in canada now how we're looking at expanding out of the as of the market um we pretty much start with students like for us the main focus is students it has been students or will be you will always be students now the expansion out of it would be those that essentially like graduate out of school right like once you come onto a lab and you find a place to stay the next step is essentially like okay what's next once you graduate what's the post-graduation life and then from there essentially like look for ways to sort of like support them in their post-grad uh laughs life so that whether it be like looking for a job or looking for like that mortgage if you're looking for a mortgage or if you're looking to sort of like being your life after school essentially where level would come in but like you know for us the focus has been students so right now we're just focusing most on students but essentially we're, we're not open to to, to exploring the other markets the other opportunities that are available to us we're not, we're, not, we're not against sorry i said we're open to exploring we're not against we're open to exploring the other markets and opportunities that are open to us yeah just want to make sure i get it right <laughs> <laughs> for those who didn't know the news uh technically there is a student who travels from calgary who lives with his parents in calgary and studies at ubc um university of british columbia yeah. and uh flies from calgary to uh, to ubc Crazy. every week comes back and is still saving some money for rent so yeah it's 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 pretty uh it's crazy, crazy. yeah yeah it's crazy oh okay. you got us like two glasses yeah that's wild man <laughs> that's that's, it. that's it's something yeah. um okay uh developing an app <laughs> is definitely not a small project oh, yeah. you know that's like uh a computer science mm. assignment or something yeah. uh what was the process of creating a loves app uh, yeah. from concept to launch what was the timeline like yeah. how, how long did it take yeah now that's a good question and the way we see it is we see it as like a lev is always the app is always launching what i mean by that is that we always like we're constantly uh, making changes constantly improving the platform making it as smooth as, as as possible and as frictionless as possible and the process for us um it, but that, that process was also an expensive lesson that we learned um in the sense that when we started building the platform we did the research the initial research you know talking to your customers and all that stuff getting some insight um but then when we went out to stuff like build out the platform we didn't involve the customers as the the the, the, the customer as we would build the platform we sort of like we talk to you once and then we're like okay we have this idea let's go and build and so we locked ourselves in our basement and just build 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 and then we launched it to the public and i remember when we launched it there was a total of like 20 downloads and from the 20 downloads 12 of those were our friends and eight of those were friends of our friends that's still crazy it's 20 downloads man is it is it no i mean it is crazy don't get me wrong it is crazy but it's crazy like it's crazy it's crazy to know it's crazy but it's funny because it's like it's your friends that you told about it's like for example me telling four friends uh no yeah me telling six friends kevin telling six question telling six and then be like yeah guys don't know don't know and then download it and then it's like oh well when i use it the app crashes when i use it this happened that happened this happened 
they were like oh snap and we also realized like there was not as much uptake as we as we expected it to be because we like we tried to like make some noise about it like you know like apply like like talk about it on, on, on instagram social media facebook um um, like as many platforms as we could to talk about like oh we're launching and all that stuff and many people like p- people didn't really interact with it as much as we thought it would and the reason why is like i said earlier we did not involve the customer throughout the process and so we had all these assumptions that we had in mind we're like oh yeah we have this great solution that's in mind we love the solution but then the problem itself wasn't necessarily being addressed and that was a lesson that had we paid attention to business model one on one, you would have known. We would have known that if you want to build a successful, at least a somewhat successful product, you want to make sure that the customer is involved at least ninety nine percent of the way. You know, because you want to make sure that, like, at the end of the day, you're building a solution for the customer. It's not for you. It's for the customer, and that solution must solve the problem that the customer is is, is having. Because if it doesn't solve their problem, they won't be willing to like pay for it. And whether it be like money, money wise, or even for the time, you know. And so, what we did after we launched it was that I was like, "Yeah, guys, the issue is that we have all these assumptions, but the customer is not involved." So we went back to the drawing board and we're like, okay, how can we how can we build a platform that will involve the customer throughout the entire process? And we went back to the drawing board and then so like you know, having those different sessions, the testing sessions. So we have a, we, we, we would have a feature that we want to implement and we go out with tests with students, we test that with landlords, you know, making sure that like they understand how it works and making sure that like, and, like, and like seeing them, even seeing them using it to using it live give us so many insights of things that are like to us it's obvious, but to them it's not. And so using that throughout the process and making sure that it makes sense when we implement them into the into the, into the platform. And then from there, remember what I mentioned about like the whole contracting out? Um, once we were able to understand, okay, for example, listing listing a, 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 a unit on the platform, it's not as easy as it should be. Why is that? Because of this, this, and that. What could be potential features that we can work with? We we'll try. We we'll, we we'll like a quick MVP to test it out with the landlord and be like, oh yeah, I like this. No, I don't like that. Yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. Once we have all of this figured out, it becomes a project that we essentially contract it out to somebody that essentially work on it, implement it, and then launch it for everybody to use it. So, 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 so it's a lot of like testing, um, making sure that we get the feedback, making sure that we implement the feedback, and then essentially like working on it with the with the, with the users. But then it still sounds like a um, natural process to go through. Technically, you have you create the platform and then you take it to the customers to try it out and you change technically perfect it. Yeah. Uh, how would how would you be able to make it faster? Like how, uh, if you had gone back, how would you yeah. get the customers and the landlords involved yeah. in creating the app without actually having the hands-on experience of the app, just being in the palms of, of the customer, yeah. telling you, okay, I don't like this, I like this. Yeah, how because the things that like for us at the beginning, like the priority was like to get something out fast. So that's why we didn't have we didn't have much interaction with the landlord, with like the customer, right? But then the downfall of that was that well, if you get it out fast, nobody's gonna use it because nobody understands how it works, right? And so now, going back, what what we would do, what what we would do differently, essentially, be able to like break down the process, you know, instead of like essentially like be like, okay, this is how you find a place, essentially break it down in a way that like okay. What does the filter system look like? Because there's a, there's a filter system. Okay, does it make sense? Like, as a student, when I go on the platform, when I open the app, do I know where to find the filter button? Do I know how to interact with the filter button? Do I is the when I click search, is does it actually bring me the the the, the things that I filtered out? You know, like essentially breaking that into different aspects and then going out to test it. And then having like I think in in the in the in the dev world they call it sprints. So we're having like different sprints, where like sprint one is just focusing on um, finding the filter button. Sprint two is focusing on putting together different buttons within the filter. And then sprint three, essentially making sure that like when you click search, it finds it. And then having the different sprints, putting putting different timelines to each, and then sort of like having a conversation with the landlord for sprint one. Does it make sense? Okay, highest conversation. Sprint two, does it make sense? Sprint three, does it make sense? It's actually breaking down in a way that you can sort of like have like those different tangible uh, deadlines and you work toward them. And so essentially to answer your question, just break down the whole process and then make it into tangible um, um, action items. Makes a lot of sense now. Okay, so yeah. technically going through every single step of 
if it's if it's a tenant trying to look for an apartment, just mm -hmm. filtering, just mm -hmm. looking, just starting to look mm -hmm. till the last step. Yeah. You need to have the customers involved. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah, somehow. But you also don't want to make sure that uh, you don't get lost in the weeds, right? Because it's easy to like um, delay a deadline because you want to have the customer involved. And so you want to make sure that like like the key aspects, the customers are involved. Like the key aspects are involved. The rest can be figured out. And then the rest is like if the rest becomes a major problem to the to the customer, uh -huh. then you involve the customer. But since you want to make sure that like you're able to move fast, but also being efficient in the process as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Oh, let me. Sorry, I'm just I'm so. I'm, okay, we've been talking about uh, creating an app, having mm -hmm. customers involved. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Can you walk me through the timeline of the development? So, from the time you said, "Okay, we're gonna create the app," mm -hmm. to the time that you finished the touches, first release that had the customers involved, mm -hmm. it was like, "Okay, this is actually practical." We're increasing. Mm -hmm. You're seeing an increase in the trends of downloads. Mm -hmm. um, how long did that take? How was how was that process like? Mm -hmm. Wow, like that's that's going way back. Um, I would say I think it was about I think it was about like three three weeks. So three weeks in the sense that from the moment we figured out that oh there is an issue with the app in the sense that people people are not using the app to so essentially, when we figure out people are not using the app and we need to get them involved until we like did the next print. So essentially, like when we launched the next like version of the app, I think it was about three weeks. Now, either if it was either it was either two weeks or three weeks. And the reason why I say that is because one of our co-founders has a very strict deadline. So his philosophy is that if you think that you can get something done in one day. You can actually get it done in one hour. <laughs> yep, you can get it done in one hour. So if you get it in one day, you can do it in one hour. And so, with that in mind, something that was supposed to be three weeks, he believed that we can get it done in one week, which the dev team told him, "Yeah, this is not possible. Like this cannot happen." You know. And so, like, I think it took us about like two weeks to sort of like like hands down just work on different features and make sure that everything works pretty well before we launch it out. And um, that was that, those those were like probably like one of the most productive weeks that we had in the sense that like from morning from like down from dawn until like, like from, from from the sunrise sorry sunrise until the 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 the, the, the sun sundown under what down until the sunset yeah sunrise to sunset sorry I'm not speaking English bro oh, English sorry. is a second language yeah so sunrise to sunset um like we're just like hands down on the app making sure that like you know like we're testing and making sure that the, the different features work um but i personally myself i wasn't necessarily super involved in the app development i'm mostly like operations and finance so like everything around like making sure that the lights are on the, the business is still running and that there's money coming in it's sort of like what i do but like it was operations like i was just like heavily involved on the testing of the, of the app you know making sure that everything works well um, making sure that like it's interactive and situated for the user, um, more stuff like, like like the whole like QA QC process, so that the thing that I was involved in. But like in terms of timeline, I think it was about like two three weeks, but like intense weeks, you know, making sure that like the thing is out. And so that was sort of the process. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, by the way, shout out to anyone who designs the user interface for a loves website is. Uh, with all the respect, one of the sexiest. Oh wow! Thank seen. you. Man. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, that was that was a working project. That was a work in progress, man. <laughs> that was a long work in progress. Like, I think, I think, what is it? The person that was, the, the person that was so so like behind it was, uh, I think, like the new website was Kevin. Actually, that was behind the the, the, the like putting it to, 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 to together. But like, if you see where the website was the first time we launched it and where it is today, who made the progress? So honestly, shout out to the team that put it, that put <laughs> that put the app together, man. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like um, I almost thought that 
did Airbnb buy a lot mm. because it really looks like this Airbnb yeah, a lot just yeah, yeah, mashed up yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, but yes, yeah. it's pretty good. So yeah. it's, if it's yeah. Kevin, Kevin, shout yeah. out, man. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot, lot of work. Like the, the, the design, like Kevin, I mean, like the website interface, like a lot of like support from Kevin. Uh, but then like the UI UX team as well also put some work into it and the dev team. Oh man, honestly, like I used to underestimate how much work the dev team actually does work do that they just actually do does actually until like i've seen it live and i'm like whoo anybody that works in dev hats off like you deserve everything you want in this world you deserve it because man <laughs> it's insane <laughs> it's crazy i can barely code on python but they like put apps together you know that people use which is like crazy so like kudos to all of them man yeah okay let's let's talk about objectives they're crucial of course in the yeah. early stages specifically um how did you set your objectives because i know you said one of the co-founders is like on the stairs about time oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah um, and he knows who he is <laughs> well, he knows exactly who he is yeah. <laughs> um but but how would you set up the objectives and and what's the because I'm assuming the goal is trying to make this a part-time side hustle toward a full-time project. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what are, what were the objectives, um, for, for that arc technically in the beginning for Ella mm -hmm. and what are, what are they now? Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. Well, well so just, just a question. So when you say objectives, is it like business objectives or like Personal like that. I'm Technically milestones. Milestones. Okay. So, okay. Let's say next September, Eleven is gonna release an Android app, for example. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, 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 good. Good question. Good question. So for us, there were different milestones that, like, as we were growing, and from the beginning and to now, like different milestones. Like in the beginning, of course, it was making sure that the app worked. You know, like making sure, like even today, like we're still making sure that the app works, but like it's less of does the feature, does this actually work to does this make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like the whole like searching for property, for example, that was like a, a key milestone to make sure that a student can go on the platform, put in the two, three filters and then find a property. And now it's going to does adding this additional feature make sense like does that does it flow smoothly so like for example does it make sense for us to have a calling feature you know like be able to like call a landlord or call a student um throughout the process does it make sense today or whereas does it make sense to i don't know having a um i don't know what's the crazy thing that i can add um, chat. I have like a, I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you check, it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. If you're international students, it kind of makes sense because you've never visited before. But like something like, I don't know, like having like Uber Eats on the platform. Mm. Like right now, I mean, it does make sense in the future, but like right now, it doesn't make sense, you know, mm. given like our constraint, our capacity, and all that stuff. But who knows? Maybe in two or three years, um, uh, when you hear this podcast, it didn't make sense and we have Uber Eats <laughs> on the app. <laughs> but it's gone it's gone from uh the, 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 does this work to uh, does it make sense so that's essentially, that's essentially how the some of the uh the 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 the, the milestones like the, the approach to the milestones have changed um now right now our focus has been on of course like growing the user base so getting more students but most like more landlords more, more housing on the houses on the platform because like we've gone to a point where there's more students than then then the listings available so the listings actually go out fast like as a landlord especially if you post like if you post over like from like december to april it goes it, like, it actually goes faster than like the, the other the, the other platforms because students are actively looking for a place to stay now if you post in the summer you have days because it just go really fast like really fast like in days i would say like, maybe like week stop like when you put this it actually goes out really fast and so like bringing more listing on the platform because the students are looking and the houses are going out pretty fast. And so like the milestones are mostly focused on like acquisition now, you know, like how can we like by, by, by this time we should have this many listing on the platform and we should be in this city, in, in this particular city, you know, and so like making sure that operationally and also like expansion wise, um, like the milestones actually make sense. And so again, from then to now is it went from like 
how do we make this work to like how does this next milestone contribute to the overall vision that we have of life? Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, now my second question is, um, you know, there, there are times that come that numbers are not looking good yeah. because you're in this transitioning stage. You yeah. know you're going in the right direction, yeah. but it's just it's just that, what's it called, hub that you have to yeah. pass. So... First of all, how do you recognize that? How do you recognize that from actually you knowing something bad is happening? Mm -hmm. And uh, second of all, is there any way to check to see um, where you can facilitate the job? Sometimes, sometimes you just gotta wait mm -hmm. and 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 wait for the customers to just uh, what's it called uh, increase in number, for example. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can actually do something mm -hmm. uh, in terms of. Uh, increasing the timeline mm -hmm. or um, setting up uh, what's it called smaller objectives so mm -hmm. so how do you how do you address that yeah you know that's a good question and for us we sort of like we have different metrics that we track on a regular basis to ensure that um um the business is growing as it should and to ensure that the different things that we're trying, um, stuff like bring us more customer, bring us more um, 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 partners and all of that. And so, you know, for us to essentially see, like when we see that, okay, we reach the point where the numbers are pretty slow, like they're not growing as fast as they should. Um, we look at whether, how are we, are we trying something different? Are we doing, are we doing something different? And if not, should we keep doing it? Um, if we keep doing it, for how long should we keep doing it? Um, if not, what else should we be do, should we be doing? And so essentially asking a sort of different questions. Now, in terms of like facilitation, is either like speeding up the process of getting the more numbers or not? We try different strategies. You know, like when it comes to like for example, um, um, user acquisition. You know, on the student side, we try a different strategy to see what works with the students, what brings us more students than less than than, than others. Same thing as well on the on the on the, on the host side. Um, I'm trying a different strategy, whether it be like like a new advertising, uh, sorry, a new marketing strategy, or uh, um, um, a new um, strategy that we're going to use to essentially acquire those landlords. Uh, other things I would try as well. And so, to sort of like, um, I'm like to, I mean, to answer your question, of course, um, we in order for us to know when the numbers are not working the way we want them to work, we track some, we track some like pretty key metrics, you know, to to, to make sure that um, over time, the numbers are growing. At, 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 at a decent pace now of course we want to increase the pace at which those numbers are growing um but just like any startup we are constrained uh financially uh capital capital wise and also like uh labor wise as well it's so sort of like how to like make sure that we don't burn ourselves out in the process of wanting to go fast but also make sure that we're also smart with the decision that we make so that we we organically increase the numbers. Of course, the vision is to have uh, the hockey stick, but of course, we have to be uh, honest with ourselves and realize that like we want something, but sometimes you need to accept that like it may not happen. Doesn't mean you settle, but accepting that like even though you try, it may not happen the way you want it to, but to keep going still. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. As the I was supposed to word this. Um, as the sugar daddy at the left. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> the sugar daddy is Amir. What? <laughs> um, what's, uh, what are the, um, the strategies to communicate Aleph's value and Aleph's goal to investors? Mm -hmm. Number one, that's that's number one question. Mm -hmm. and number two, of course, uh, investors are selective of who they invest in, mm -hmm. but at the same time, startups are ideally selective of who invests in their company because mm -hmm. some people are looking for short term, yeah. um, what's it called, um, profits, and some people are looking in the long term. So, yeah. so how do you how do you go for that? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Now, for us, one thing that is very important for us is that with Alev, is mostly about the social impact that we're looking to, to 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 do with the platform so when i say social impact is i mean that every student that comes on the platform every listing 
or every level that come that come to the platform is not another number it's an actual person who has a life and who chose to be a student because they want to have a better life just like they choose to be a landlord because in one way or another they want to have a better life as well and so stuff like bringing out those different values into the picture when you're pitching in to, 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 to an investor is definitely key uh, most of the investors that we do those stuff like going after and looking at are so those that essentially inv uh, invest in that social uh, impact, you know, so like uh, the community impact uh, 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 space. These are things that like stuff like being able to like, communicate that to them because if you think about it, all those different landlords, so investors have either been a students, um, are a students, or are somewhat really really are somewhat related to someone that is that is a student. And so, in one way or another, they're impacted by the work that we're doing. Same thing as well on the landlord side, you know, either the, either the, they are involved in real estate, um, know someone that's in real estate, or like have some, in a way, shape, or form, like involve, have their hands in real estate. And so, be able to like communicate that and ensure that, of course, it aligns with whatever um, like um, values, whatever, um, 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 what do you call it? Like, there's this word for like investment. I don't know if the word is investment minus, sorry. Return. I guess I guess return, but like I, return is also is I I'm actually getting to the return part, but it's like one that's like their investment motive or strategy. I don't know, but essentially, make sure that like whatever we, we, we we're pitching them also aligns with their vision, mm -hmm. you know, and of course has some 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 sense of return, you know, like they must make money. Otherwise, they're not going to work with us, you know? And so that, those are things that we keep in mind as we approach the, the, those different investors. Now, when it comes to, like, working with us, we're looking for some, we're looking for investors that are willing to go in the trenches with us. You know, like, we're going to work together. That's where we're going. Like, we're not, we're not, we're not, because even though we want to, uh, uh, like, the vision is to, you know, like, get there and be, like, the main housing and living provider for students off campus um like we we, we recognize that it's going to be challenging and we want someone that's going to be by our side as we go through the challenge you know and we're not looking for the short-term ones that i you know what, let me just put some money in and then hope for like a 20 30 percent return in, in 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 like a few months that's 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 not what we're looking for we're looking for like someone that, like, like, that understand the vision understand the mission and that's willing to work with us to mentor us to like introduce us to key industry players to essentially like grow together and get us to get get, get us to that that, that that point that we're that we're, we're, we're trying to get at mm -hmm. and so these are some of the things that we look at look for when, when these are some of the things that we look for when we approach investors and when approach when investors approach us <sighs> toughest time i think <laughs> every time with the lead is tough <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> But the toughest time. Oh man! No, you know, you know, be, being a startup founder, being being a founder in general, like the, the, there is no like there's no class that can teach you what it's like to be a founder, or there is no like degree that you can take and be like, you know what, I'm a founder. It's one of those things where like you have to experience it, you know. And there's some, there's like there are. There are long nights, long sleepless nights, and long days, you know. And um, myself, because I'm the operation in finance, like, I know the numbers. You know, like, I'm in charge. Like, I see the numbers, like, external numbers, you know, like, the growth and all that stuff. But, like, internal numbers in the sense that, okay, how much does it cost to run the business? Like, I see it. And so, I, I know how much we need. And so, like, on the cost, like, on, on the regular, on a constant basis, like, I'm, I'm always thinking about those numbers. Like, okay. Are we burn like is our burn rates burning too fast? Or is it going too far? Growing too fast? Or when is our next income like our next flow of cash gonna come from? Like all these different questions I ask myself. And I think probably one of the toughest times I would say I would say I mean the, the most recent one would be the time before um, like one of the recent pitch competitions that we want that we want. And truth be told, when we went into the competition, we were pretty much going broke. Yeah. Like, 
the money wasn't coming as 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 much as 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 much as it should. Now 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 now, now we're not rich. We're not we're not balling. You know what? I'm, chill. You know, relax, relax. We're not rich, okay? We want the money. Any investors listening to this? Any grants? Anybody? We want the money. Please come talk to us. We want this, you know. <laughs> but like right now, we're not in a, we're in a better position. Now I'm not gonna say we're going broke, but it was like if we don't play our cards right. It's not looking good, bro. It is not looking good. Uh, and when we went for the for, for that page competition, um, I told myself, we're like, we're living here with something. Like, we have to. Because the numbers are not looking as good as we want them to. You know, it was like one of those, like, slump. Like, one is, like, just business going down. You know, that business being business. And, like, we're just, like, asking asking myself, like, 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 snap. Like, what happens if this doesn't go through? Or what happens if this doesn't work out? And... Um, one in there, you know, um, taking we're competing with like companies that make tens of thousands in MRR, like tens of thousands, some are even making like approximately like, even millions of dollars a year competing in those companies. And we were like, you know, like we were focused on a social impact, like they were making like big numbers, and we're not making like as big as them, right. Uh, but we're still able to sort of like, you know, push through, push through the different noise, the challenges and all that stuff, and, you know, come back as a winner, you know, with like some, 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 some fun that's actually helping us like run the business still. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because like, why, 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 why it was one of the toughest times was because some of those times were like, you know, when you have different options, you're less nervous, like less stressed. Mm-hmm. But then we have like that one option, like only one option, and it must work. Like it has to go through, you know. Because sometimes you're like, you know what? I can't control things. You know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, and it is what it is. It was one of those options where like it either works out or it works out. Like there's no other option. Like it has to work out, and it worked out. And so like we have been in different situations before like that before, uh, but like this is one of the ones that I remember mo- mo- most vividly, and it honestly like teaches you to. To be, to, to believe, you know, like to believe, like this is one of the things that happens with like, where you're like, you know, where you're like, damn, like we actually have something here. You know, like, of course, you know, like, like sometimes and many founders, many of them that, 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 that listen to this podcast, you have to lie to yourself, you know, <laughs> you have to, like you have to lie to yourself and believe that you're the best guy in town. Like you have to. You know, even though your app bugs or crashes or your platform or your service is not the best, as a founder, you have to like you have to lie to yourself and you have to like fake that confidence. Not necessarily like fake it, fake whatever you're selling, but like tell yourself that you're confident, that you have the best thing in town, and that you deserve it in order for you to step into the fact that you actually into, into step to step that you actually deserve it and that what you have is actually the best in town. And there are many times where you know that like, you, you you find yourself in front in front of like that one option and like either it works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, shit. Where do we go from here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so you focus on like, I don't care about whether it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, that's a thought for another time. But like right now, I'm just focusing on making it work. And then just and then you just believe, you just lock in and you just make it happen. So yeah. Thank you. Um, you and uh, I had a talk with Kevin about two years ago. Yeah. Uh, you and Kevin, uh, maybe I'm just too, uh, what is it called, involved in Kobe Bryant, <laughs> Kobe Bryant content. But every time I'm talking to either you or Kevin, you guys are just giving off Kobe Bryant vibes. <laughs> like, this Kobe is That's just... Kobe, man. I cannot. Kobe, 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 man. That's the mentality, the member mentality. You have to have it, you know? You have to. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... That's that's something very precious. That's that's yeah. that's valuable. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I really really enjoyed every talk. Pleasure, it was man. it was great. Thank you very much. And good luck for your love. Say hi to the team. Hundred percent. Thank you, Amir, for having me. You know, see. What's the what's the what's the podcast? Huh? What's the name of the podcast? Oh, Zone Z. Zone Z? Yes. Yeah, thank you, me for having me on Zone Z. You know, Zone Z, man, I'm so, I'm grateful, you know, for this opportunity. You know, it's like, not everybody gets invited here and you invited me, you know, so I appreciate it. And I can't wait to see how far you take Zone Z, man. So, like, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much.
Yeah. I'm not gonna delete that out, out from the record. I'm just keep oh yeah, you keep it. You better keep it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you better keep it. Let's let's see. Uh, organic. Yes, okay. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, see you guys next time. Bye. -bye. Yeah.